Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Errol Harvey uh, from the Academy of Technology and Engineering. Um, first of all, as uh, is our custom at the Academy, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting. Um, in my case, where I'm based in Melbourne, so that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is a, a workshop which is uh, being put together by the Industry and Innovation Forum of the Academy. And um, there has been a small working group who have helped put this together. Uh, Dimity Doonan, who may be joining us a little later, is the chair of the forum. And I'd also like to thank um, Simon Pervin, Ian Dagley, Leanne Bond, and Nika Falker, who helped put together um, the, uh, the workshop which we're all going to participate in. I guess we're, we're all very familiar, hopefully now, with Zoom. Um, but just to remind you, this is a meeting and not a webinar. So we can all hear your voices and we do want to hear all of your voices. On the other hand, if there are some other sounds uh, which are behind you, which are not part of the meeting, we would appreciate you staying on mute until you need to say something. So it'd be great to keep yourself on mute. The other thing I want to direct you to is the chat function. Um, good to click that on and watch the pane. It'll be one of the most effective ways that we can have the conversation uh, going through our discussions today. And we'll also be monitoring that. Uh, if you have a question which you'd like to raise, it's probably best to use the hand up uh, function. And those of us that are watching the, uh, the chats will let the appropriate person know. Um, an alternative is to wave your hand. Uh, that works too. It just depends how small the pictures are on the screen as to whether we see that. But this is a workshop. It is meant to be interactive. And it is also an informal workshop. So um, please uh, do butt in whenever you, you want. And we look forward to your contribution. So um, I guess by way of introduction, this is around um, circular economy, which is becoming a real catchword these days. And in particular, looking at the plastics industry. It comes after a report which the Academy launched in November last year towards a waste free economy. And you may have been able to download either the summary version or the full version of that uh, a little earlier in some of the notes which were sent around. So the, um, that document, and, and there's also been several others uh, coming out, CSIRO's put one out recently and some state governments have as well. These documents tend to be pretty high level and they look at some of the major uh, issues and incentives which uh, are involved in trying to kickstart an effective circular economy. This workshop is at the complete opposite end. Um, in this workshop, we're aiming to look at small steps which we can use to stimulate the circular economy. Um, I guess, you know, the way to climb up Everest is, is one step at a time, although there's another elephant eating analogy that one could use. Um, but the, the point is that if we're going to make the big cultural and economic shifts which are needed in order to get a true circular economy going, they're going to start with small steps. And so we would very much like to see practical outcomes from this workshop. Now, the Academy's role in that is to bring you guys together and to start the conversation. But any good ideas or any thoughts for projects and so on are yours. And we would very much encourage you to um, carry on the conversation with each other after we have finished this workshop. And that would be one of the most useful outcomes of the workshop. But if in combination, you find some small projects or some seed ideas, something else that you want to carry on. Let us know at the Academy, that's a good outcome. Um, but we do encourage you to, to progress the, uh, the thoughts and the ideas 
um, beyond uh, this meeting today. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to um, also welcome um, our first keynote, who will also be participating in the one of the breakout groups, um, and that's um, Peter Malheron. Um, Peter is the uh, founder of BuildFit, which is a compliance uh, platform for the built environment, uh, verifying claims made by manufacturers. Um, his career has followed the product life cycle from design through to manufacturing, construction, facility, and waste management. And this experience has informed his research in business model innovation and applying sustainable practice towards the circular economy. Peter holds a master's in sustainable practice from RMIT, and he's a member of the Circular Economy Hub there. And Peter, I'd like to hand it over to you to kickstart us off with um, a bit of a talk around uh, the economic aspects of uh, plastic circular economy. So welcome to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Errol. Um... I'll be sharing my screen in a moment. Um, just want to thank you and you know, bring this together in RMIT and uh, welcome all these esteemed and even more esteemed guests after yesterday are here. Um, I'll share my screen now and um, see if we can just uh, get into that. Um, just, just briefly, I'll be talking about a number of case studies I'll be going back a decade and I'll be going forward a decade and uh, looking at the opportunities today. Um, we've got three case studies. So it's, it's where we're actually putting to practice a lot of this theory that um, with colleagues at RMIT we've, we've brought together. Um, and it's very much around technology and, and data as, a, as an enabler of change. And, and I'll touch on the yeah, it's an immense opportunity. It's a it's a fundamental shift in the way we we look at at growth, even, but also the metrics of growth and how we uh, how we can benefit from the circular economy. So um, I'll just talk about the circular economy advantage and the advantage of that, as opposed to a, a linear or or, or you know, extractive economy. And I should add that all of this work has been done well. Most of it has been done in, with, in collaboration with RMIT. I've been at the Graduate School of Business and Law for a number of years. Um, Kevin Argus is in the audience and he's, he's provided you know, immense, immense support in that. Um, can you see that screen okay? Yep, okay. So thanks, Errol. And um, what we'll be talking about is, is the objective quality evidence necessary to inform decisions. And of course, data is a, a enabler of that, of that objective, objectivity. So taking a lot of the subjectivity out of our decision-making at every stage of the product life cycle. So, so of course, there's no, no start and end in a circular economy. Every, every stage of the product life cycle is, has a, has a precedent and, a, and an antecedent. And, and so we're looking at that data informing those decisions. And also very much emphasizing that, that the consumer as an enabler of change through how they spend their money, how, how the consumer spends their money informs both, both forwards and backwards. Um, and of course, the biggest consumer in the country is the government. So government is an enabler of change. I said I'd go back a decade. The National Waste Policy back in 2009 had an outcome as the Product Stewardship Act. Um, so that was about a decade ago. Egan's and um, Egan's Asset Management is one of our case studies and BuildFit were the first applicants under that Product Stewardship, um, Product Stewardship Act under the voluntary provisions. That, that was rejected um, for reasons we still don't know. And the Product Stewardship Act has, it hasn't sat on the shelf, but it has, certainly hasn't been utilized to its potential. So, so that's a, a decade past. I've said that's a barrier and an opportunity. It's a significant uh, barrier when legislation is made, policies are put in place and then not utilized. So that, that sends the wrong message to business. And, and that's something that, 
has informed our approach. Now we've got the National Waste Policy 2019, we've got amendments with an extra focus on packaging and plastics. So that's a great thing. Um, but that takes us to today and we've got a decade to make change. So can we afford to wait on government to make change or can we take that legislation and, and use, use our, the skills we've got to make the change necessary? And we, we, we'd refer to the latter being, let's make it an industry driven change and government as a procurer, government as a consumer. So we had the um, Commonwealth procurement rules, which is a driver of change if they're adhered to. So a similar sort of story, complying with Australian standards is a requirement and by default that supports local content because of course local businesses are compliant with standards and compliant with um, employment practice, understand the local environment and have a lesser burden to demonstrate compliance um, is the thinking around that. So, so if we have these policy and regulation mechanisms, let's use them and put them in place. And so we've gone about building a technology platform to enable uh, a, a preference on local, local content, local standards and, um, and procurement as a mechanism. That was at federal level. We spent most of last year, most of 2019 now, most of 2019 working with the state government in looking at how their social procurement framework can be used as an enabler of change. And towards the end of that year, they were bringing up the um, circular economy policy, which has informed significantly at state level around, around waste, utilisation of waste and, and bringing waste into the built environment. The social procurement framework looks at, look, was looking particularly at public infrastructure and, and the very significant spend around that and how do we use that procurement as an enabler of change to inform change and to stimulate change in lo local outcomes. And of course, that has a very long legacy, very long, long tail. And um, how we spend today impacts how we're gonna meet our net zero emissions, et cetera, in future. So if we're building in liability today, we're, we're increasing that, that uh, burden in the future. Um, so we, we looked at that. It was a very much a government research and industry collaboration. Buildfit was coming from the industry side, RMIT from research, and of course, at state government level. And I worked for, you know, we brought in some um, interns and we worked very closely with Public Transport Victoria then they had a shift in, in, in organisation to become Department of uh, Transport and that, that initiative lost momentum. So it was again an opportunity to say, well, we need to make, build mechanisms that are not dependent on the, on the cycle of government, if you like. Um, and then we, we looked at government as a major consumer. So government spending between 25 and 30%, depending on the, on the, on the information we use. 25 to 30% of GDP. So they're a very, very significant consumer. How do we use that? They're using our taxes. They're using, using you know, the citizens, the, the taxpayer, the local constituents in goods and services, how can we inform those decisions they make to benefit the local local consumers, local local citizen? Um, so it flips that, go, that role of government from policy and regulation to a consumer, which of course it puts it on a, on a level with the local, local consumer and initiating change as opposed to imposing change from above through regulation, we can use it as an initiator of change. As, it, as from from below, we then looked at the life cycle of products and and broke that into three three sectors, if you like: the production, the consumption, and then the recovery of those resources back into that life cycle. So this is very much a circular economy and looking at those that flow of material. Now, a common denominator in all of these three case studies that I'll I'll talk briefly about is using data as a, as a mechanism to inform those decisions, inform those choices. 
and then enabling the capture of that value in, the, in these different models. And so there's three very different case studies. Um, one's in, in, in furniture. So that's, that's in a, um, a reuse and remanufacture of furniture. So it's, that's, that's as a service, as opposed to providing a product. Another one is soft plastics, which is very relevant today. Looking at that waste as a resource into public infrastructure. And the third is looking at local government procurement in new builds. And so informing the decisions that local government makes in how they spend their money. The first case study was with Egan's, as I mentioned, we were the first applicants under the Product Stewardship Act back in 2012, 13, um, unsuccessful. But at that stage, Egan's was employing 20 to 30 people and with a very strong focus in Victoria. They're now employing over 120, 120 employees. Uh, they're, in, they're in four or five states and their principal clients are government and, and corporate, so sizable corporates. So downsizing, relocating, getting rid of furniture or moving furniture, reconfiguring that furniture as a service, taking it and refurbishing it and selling it on with the warranty, so as, as new warranty, or providing it as a service. So providing furniture as a service as opposed to a product. So you've, you've, you move into your product service systems. Um, and they've done that without any government, government support and improved a, a model, a so, both social and, and environmental value model um, that, that, that is growing significantly. So they're, they're, I'd suggest they're a leader in that field. And they've grown up from a man and a truck to employing 120 people across four states. Um, and it was from that that, that Kevin led this, this paper and, and presented the paper last year um, around using data as an anti, as a, uh, antecedent to informing decisions and data as a viable, to create viable circular economy models. So we used, we, we formalized that um, research we'd done with Egan's. Egan's had uh, 20 years of data. So we had the opportunity to go back and see how that informed the business model. And that was a, I think it was a very important piece because it actually looked at how we can use that thinking, use that methodology in other areas. And certainly it's a foundation of the build fit model to take data and using data as a verification tool at, at, through the life cycle. The, this is the case study we're doing now, and that's, that's around using plastic waste, so soft, soft plastics that are, that are a waste product traditionally, and how do we use them and create economic value in public infrastructure? And this, this is using data and using verification points through that life cycle and capturing information at each of those points and independently verifying the claims made, the, the, the passage of material and, the, and using data as an enabler of those decisions um, and then providing value to each one of those stakeholders through that life cycle. So collecting plastics at, your, at supermarkets, et cetera, processing that into a, into a value added product and then delivering that into public infrastructure. And there's, yeah, this is a huge opportunity, I believe, for a lot of these smaller, smaller projects you touched on, Errol, were where, you know, how do we use this? Well, there's all sorts of plastic products out there that can start being used if we clean up that supply chain. If we clean up the data and the information in that supply chain, how do we use them? And you can start informing upstream, up, up your supply chain, and then inform downstream to say, what does that consumer bought? What have they, you know, what have they purchased? And does it stand up to standards? Um, and then this, of course, can be applied to the new, new products going into new bills with local government procurement to say, I want to build a childcare centre or I want to build a, you know, whatever it is, a road, a childcare centre, path bench, you know, whatever that product or, or manufactured environment, the built environment that the local council is building to say, we're putting this out to tender. 
here's some criteria that we want our tenderers to meet. Here's, here's the tender specification that says, you know, we want to meet these criteria, social environmental outcomes. Here's a selection criteria against that, and then a verification. So using data as an enabler of that verification again. So it's, it's building that supply chain in virtual to inform the selection and, and the, the award of tender. And then of course, if you've got that history of data, you can then start informing your, your own operate, your facility management, et cetera. And you can also inform those end of life opportunities. So those pathways to uh, circularity at end of life. So we had those three, state, those three case studies. Um, thank you very much, I might add, Hatsy, for the report you guys have produced. And I just looked at the opportunity presented to bring that maturity up around the feasibility for business and the, and the policy and regulatory readiness. I mean, those, those were, if you like, the two weak, weaker areas in the maturity. Um, and the three priorities, of course, waste, waste avoidance, increasing productivity, and making informed decisions, and of course, the investment and regulatory environment. Um, if I can, without being, you know, without you know, being rude, if we reverse those priorities, just how they're, they're presented there, and we're using government as a procurement tool, spending taxpayers' money, citizens, local constituents, that'll, draw, that'll create the economic viability for a lot of these businesses and inform a lot of those businesses about where I can invest, where I can, where I can comply through government spending and using data to inform those decisions, which of course, if we're using clean data, will raise the productivity and avoid the waste. So, so just, we've done a lot of this reversing what, what we're doing at the minute, which of course we need to do on a, on a grand scale. I've just put in some of the numbers there from your report, 2.7 tonnes per person per year. That equates to a council that has 10,000 residents. They now know what they potentially need to offset per year. And that sends a message out to business to say, we're looking for innovations. We're looking for business models that, that pull down on that, on that waste load. So it's using councils, creating demand, which the market can respond to. And of course the market, you know, incentivized market will respond with innovation. So we said, well, look, let's look at our current business models, our current, how, how the economy operates at the minute and, and try and reverse that flow, that value flow is traditionally from the producer to the consumer and the consumer often wears the cost or wears the, the burden of, of, of work to do. Um, we're saying, what if we inform the consumer so that those resources can be returned to the producer? And we've got the, the community, the crowd, the commons providing that verification. So your academia, you get, you know, all, of, all of the community providing you know, informed trust to that ecosystem. The producer informing the consumer and the consumer being then able to return those resources to the producer. And that's essentially the cycle of the circular economy and government, government providing that rules-based environment to operate within. So it kind of reverses that material flow. To do this, I mean, you you, Errol, you touched on the, on the size of this challenge. Um, we need new metrics in this sort of environment. We need new ways of measuring cost and price and value and, and valuing waste. So waste as a latent resource and then new measures of growth. And I've just touched on it here about utilization and using utilization instead of production as a measure of growth. And, and that's probably another topic someday. Um, and then we looked at the, the volume of waste. So there's various reports saying we're between nine and 12% circular currently. Um, in the construction industry, I think it's 96% of value in materials is lost. So while we may recover the materials, the value of those materials is generally lost. They've gone through a process and um, how do we turn that around? How do we use that Egan's model to say, provide those products as services 
and recover them as is when that utility has been used. And that utility can then keep perpetuating. And, and in all areas of our economy, there's an opportunity to capture that waste. So it's looking for a linear economy and turning that round. Um, Australia's, I think Australia's operating at about four times. So we're, our, um, our overshoot day is in April, whereas, whereas globally it's in August. Australia is one of the largest consumers. We have a role, a responsibility for that change. Um, and how do, we, how do we achieve that zero drawdown on natural resources for future generations? So these are, I guess, are underlying principles of what we're proposing. Um, this gets into a bit of the longer term is to say we're, if we're just 10% circular at this stage, the opportunities of, of perpetuating, perpetuating those resources is immense. It's, it, it allows for growth, but not growth in extraction, growth in value capture. And this is, this is a slide from an, another presentation I've got, but it looks at what does the future economy look like? And once we start cycling those resources and energy costs come down, we can start perpetuating that cycle of resources back into the economy getting value from them every time, getting utility from them each time. And so you start drawing down and, and, and you start drawing down on the impact that those materials are having in our economy towards ultimately achieving balance with our natural environment. Um, and this is, this is somehow what it looks like if we start drawing down on waste, which of course topic today is on plastics and capture that value from those wastes, our natural environment is gonna start recovering. And the greatest opportunity to implement this, we've looked at the federal, we've looked at state governments, greatest opportunity to uh, enact this, I believe, and I'm not alone, is through local councils, because they're the closest to the public consumer and they're delivering services directly to the consumer. So within Australia, there's, there's about a hundred local councils have declared a climate emergency representing about nine, nine million people. Um, that, that's the opportunity for change. So all three of those case studies I referred to have local councils as, as, as clients. And it's about how local councils are spending their funds. Um, that, that kind of sums it up. It's kind of handballing the uh, impetus to the local council, um, but the opportunity is immense to, to, to spend less and spend more wisely. Um, and I'm not sure, Errol, if I'm taking questions now, but uh, thank you. And thank you very much, Peter. So a uh, round of virtual applause. <laughs> I'm not thank sure you. how it's done on Zoom properly, but that, that was a great scene setter. Thanks. I love the idea of it being data driven to try to stimulate the benefits of the economy. And of course, that raises all sorts of good questions about, you know, are we correct, collecting the right data, giving it the right labels? Who, who should collect the data and so on. So I think that's a terrific stimulus for, for our round table discussion. Um, it, we can take a couple of questions if anybody has some which they'd like at this general um, outset, or we will break out into breakout discussions and there will be a chance later on for, for group discussion. But does anybody have any questions for Peter? Uh, George, yes. Hi, thanks, Peter. Uh, just a quick question, a very broad question. Just with regards or in comparison with local government and sort of state and federal government making use of procurement to sort of drive you know, the changes we want, how does, that, how does that match up across those three levels of government at the moment? Um, I, there's a lot of good intent. So those, the Commonwealth procurement rules were set up. Um, it was in the days um, um, Xenophon was in, and he and he implemented changes. He left Parliament, and those changes got those those procurement rules got changed again. Um, that's part of the challenge. I touched on that. How the local council, state, and federal compare? I think that was your question, George. Um, I can't really say. I don't have any stats on that, but 
local council is closest to the community, they do the waste collection and they're, they're spending money on roads, schools, you know, the local environment. They're, they're closest to the community. So if it's a community driven or initiated change, I'd suggest that local council's the way to go and pu push it up from below. Um, but, but the stats on who spends most and, and the efficacy of those, I don't have those details. But good question. <laughs> uh, John. Uh, it seems to me, Peter, that um, uh, part of the problem, of course, is uh, not just the collection of waste, but how that waste gets sorted. And local government is somewhat uh, integral to that process in that it does collect the waste, but we're really doing nothing about the investment structure in the uh, in sorting of those uh, that waste. Uh, once it's once it's collected, how do we how do we try and get enough investment either into the local council community via state government or federal government that can enable that first part of the process to start, if you like? Yeah, um, no, that's great, John. Um, so one of the councils, I, I believe, Hobson's Bay's here, um, they've implemented a four bin system. Now. This is all part of driving that, that incentive. I'd be going, you know, ideally, you'd be going upstream. You'd be creating value in that waste before it got to the consumer. And you, or you'd be creating, you'd creating incentive for the consumer to say, well, that, that plastic or that bottle is worth something. Now, they, then you get into the, um, the, the packaging recovery, you know, the, the incentivizing packaging recovery. Um, once we, once we hit a point where there's a demand for that waste, that waste will start getting sorted. I mean, we've taken a very much a, a, a point in time and working upstream to create incentive upstream. Um, details about how you, you know, create incentive for the consumer to sort waste, I'd be putting that responsibility back onto the producer of waste. So the the packaging, and that's a number of people who we're working with, is the producers, the big brands, the, the organisations that are creating the packaging. So there's a lot of innovation around food packaging, which I'm aware of. Um, how do you start you know, reducing the number of different types of waste produced? You might have an increased cost in one and, and lower cost in the other and creating an equitable value across a number of them. Um, that's that's the hard that's the hard nut is to say, you know creating those pathways those resilient pathways or resilient markets for the waste but um, that's a that's a community behaviour community maturity that Errol touched on earlier um, there's a there's a there's a huge discussion there John <laughs> and that's exactly what we wanted you to do was warm us up for that discussion so thanks Peter you've done that really well thank you. I'd like to introduce our second keynote, um, who's uh, Mitchell Colleen. Um, the, the second breakout discussion that we're gonna uh, have here is looking more at the, um, the technical solutions around raw material inputs into plastics manufacture and, and look at some of the issues related to um, packaging and, and how we build and make um, the, uh, the polymers that we use. Um, and Mitchell is a terrific speaker for that. Um, Mitchell's the uh, managing director of Lindell Basel. Uh, that's a um, multinational company listed on the New York Stock Exchange, um, one of the world's largest plastics, chemicals and refinings company, and runs a, um, a polypropylene plant in Geelong, um, Australia's only polypropylene uh, facility on shore. Um, Mitchell spent 12 years having a lot of uh, extensive expatriate experience in, in the, his multinationals, so time in uh, Dubai, in Hong Kong and other parts of the world. Um, and then, as I said, returned uh, recently back to Australia, had some roles here uh, and then became managing director. I guess the other thing that Mitchell may not say in his talk is um, He's, he's a graduate uh, from chemistry at the University of Melbourne and PhDs in um, polyurethanes, and that was from the University of Queensland, so clearly a local lad as well. Mitchell, thanks for your time in uh, uh, coming to talk to us, and uh, I'd like to hand it over to you. 
and you're on mute just for the moment. Yep, now I'm not on mute, I hope. Yep, that's um, good, thanks. Yep. Okay. And then I'll share my presentation. So thanks, uh, Errol, and, and thanks, Ian, for inviting me to come along and speak uh, to this ATSE meeting. Um, you'll see that this is actually a paper I gave last November. <clears throat> I, we are a New York listed company and getting approval to speak in public is always difficult. So I've left it exactly as it was and uh, Ian said it'll, it'll tick the boxes for today's discussion, I hope, by giving you a bit of a tour about what a company like ours, one of the uh, leading plastic producers in the world, what are we doing about the, and how are we thinking about the uh, circular economy? And as I say, what are the projects that we're actually looking at in Australia to try and uh, work towards that waste-free future? And at the end, I'd be very interested to gain feedback on you know, what you think we're doing. Are we doing the right stuff, the wrong stuff, and, and how uh, we, we could be uh, doing better uh, to improve uh, plastic circularity. Um, so I apologise if any of you have heard this paper at, at uh, uh, the SPE conference, but um, hopefully I'll try and put a bit of a different slant on it anyway. <clears throat> uh, so first of all, I will just briefly, we already heard from Errol, uh, one of the largest chemical companies in the world. We're certainly uh, one of the largest, if not the largest uh, polyolefin producer in the world, polyolefin being polypropylene plus polyethylene and polybutylene, that class of olefinic polymers and we're also the largest licensor of technology so we you know even we're not making the stuff we're licensing uh, uh, very large quantities of, uh, of, of production capacity around the world um, we're also a very large compounder of, of polyolefin so we have we go one step past the reactor and we're the one of the largest compounders in the world of uh, plastics so we have some good we have technology know-how in terms of mixing and compounding and upgrading plastics in, in extruders, uh, plastic alloys, basically. Um, <clears throat> and we're also working very actively in the area of uh, um, uh, recycling of plastics and plastic feedstocks. Uh, in Australia, we already heard we, we are the only one of two la remaining resin producers in, in Australia, uh, only ourselves and Quenos. Uh, pro we're producing polypropylene, Quinos producing polyethylene. In fact, some of their polyethylene, again, made on our, li our licensed technology. Um, so we're down at Geelong and we're heavily integrated into both into the Viva refinery and we also rely on the mobile refinery. So one thing I may touch on later is we, I think if we don't maintain our refinery and chemical industry in Victoria, uh, our challenge to to really come to a circular economy in Australia is going to be put to the test. In fact, we'll end up exporting our waste, uh, which has been a problem we've had from the beginning, that we've been too intent on exporting waste and not adding value to it in Australia. So before I get into what we're doing here in Australia, very quickly, what do we look at in terms of sustainability globally? So these are our company's global goals. Uh, on the right, you see climate change and thriving societies. That's out of scope for today's discussion. But I will say one of the things we're extremely proud of is our focus and global leadership in safety metrics and safety performance. One of the uh, best performing companies in the world in terms of safety. Uh, it's the top 10 percentile of the ACE uh, American Chemical Council members in terms of safety. So we're very proud of our safety priority for both ourselves and, and for our communities in which we operate. But the topic today is about plastic waste. So I'm gonna quickly uh, whip through what our global priorities are in plastic waste management. Uh, before we move uh, into maybe some of the things we're doing in Australia. The first one is diversion of millions of tonnes from the ocean. So we heard from Peter about creating demand and value for waste, and, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, one of our, our top priorities is how do we create value for waste plastic so, so that there is a, a, a benefit to capturing plastic and not letting it leak into the ocean because ocean plastics is for us a really critical uh, concern and uh, very high on our priority list. Now, most plastic waste occurs out of uh, Southeast Asia and, 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 the, and the Far East. And so what, we, what, what our focus there is on the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. So this is a $1.5 billion industry fund to try and pilot 
and, uh, and, and demonstrate technologies to add value on plastic and keep plastic out of the ocean. Now, I'm not going to go more in detail of that today. And in fact, at the SPE conference, we had a speaker from the Alliance uh, uh, in Singapore. So uh, I didn't really get into that much detail. But what it's about is how do we support communities, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, to uh, add value to waste plastic and therefore uh, prevent it entering the ocean. I do think there is a role for Australia to play in that and some of the technologies we develop here and the World uh, Business Council for Sustainable Development is a partner. And I know the, the, the World Business Council in Australia is, is looking at how we could engage Australia into those initiatives. Uh, if people are interested to learn more about that, they can talk to me or the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. The next one is um, our target by 2040 uh, to achieve 100% recycled reco uh, reuse and recovery of plastics packaging. Um, this is really driven through, we can't do this as a company, this is really driven through uh, organisations such as Plastics Europe and the American Chemical Council. In Australia, that means uh, uh, Chemistry Australia is our partner here. And we've been the uh, founding member of Plastic Stewardship Australia, an initiative of Chemistry Australia. And uh, in fact, a colleague of mine who I'd hope to join us today, Rob Moran, uh, is uh, the chairman of that uh, of Plastic Stewardship Australia. Uh, here in, in, in Australia and, and, and you can see some of the early members and founding members and this uh, group is growing uh, as we speak as we get uh, more and more members uh, engaged uh, in uh, Plastic Stewardship Australia. Uh, I'll come to what uh, I think um, the, or the core anchor for Plastic Stewardship Australia is going to be or is but first of all I just want to mention one initiative of Plastic Stewardship Australia which is Operation Clean Sweep. Uh, this is a global initiative, and this is where we go back and keeping our own house in order. So we're plastics manufacturers, our customers are using pellets. One of the things that uh, does contribute to ocean plastics is uh, fugitive emissions of plastic pellets. And so Operation Clean Sweep in partnership with Tangaroa Blue is about us as an industry taking accountability to ensure that our own uh, production or products or, or feedstocks don't end up in the environment. And uh, for those of you dealing with companies, I'd like to encourage everyone to get out there and uh, uh, promote Operation Clean Sweep and take the pledge to keep the plastic out of the environment. But apart from that, Plastic Stewardship Australia is really focused on the uh, waste hierarchy. And I think we don't use this as enough of an anchor when we discuss these issues around a, a waste-free future. Uh, you know, like with uh, green electricity, it's not all about making renewable electricity. Often saving electricity is where the real uh, low hanging fruit is. And so we shouldn't for a moment forget the top of uh, the hierarchy in terms of reduce and re, uh, repair. However, what does tend to happen, and we'll come to it later, is we do tend to talk a lot about recycling because that's where in Australia we lack uh, infrastructure. Um, but for us as an industry, we've been long focused on the top of that. In fact, uh, you know, that's really talking about, uh, for those in the plastics industry, stiffer, tougher, faster. So, you know, in terms of reducing uh, the, the, the weight of, of plastics we're using in packaging and other applications, uh, we've been working on that for decades. We're also quite actively uh, engaged in looking at durable applications and reusable applications. So how, how do we get things like, for example, large blow moulding, which is going to be the focus of a new asset we're building in the US, which is reusable uh, large, packet, large part packaging uh, for, for semi-bulk deliveries. Uh, also focusing on you know, products that have 50, 60, 70 year uh, life, uh, such as membranes and pipes and those sort of applications. And of course, we're the largest supplier of plastics into the automotive industry. Another example of more long lived plastics that we're very focused on and, and, and use and reuse and repair. But of course, uh, what we've got to focus on in Australia is also this lack of uh, infrastructure that John also mentioned in the recycling area. So as a global company, we're targeting 2 million metric tonnes of recycle and renewable plastic uh, by 2030. Renewable, or, by renewable I mean circular or uh, bio-based feeds. 
So that's the focus that we have as a global company. And frankly, Australia being a G20 company, country and recent legislation about uh, uh, waste management and export bans, we think Australia is a, a fertile place, uh, becoming a fertile place with regulation for us to engage and for us to contribute towards our global goals of 2 million tonnes. So that brings me then to what we're doing more locally uh, in terms of mechanical recycling and advanced recycling, which I'll come to uh, in the end. So Lion Delta Cell globally has three pillars that we're working on in terms of achieving that 2 million tonne uh, target for re recycle and renewable uh, 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 plastics. First of all, mechanical recycling, which is the classic um, cleaning, remelting and, and compounding. We're working globally uh, on our quality circular plastics platform with Suez uh, and, uh, and, and we have, and I'll come to that in a moment. We have our molecular recycling technology, which we call advanced recycling. And this is about taking plastic back to liquid feedstocks so that we can then remanufacture that into virgin-like plastic through our existing assets. And the way we get that through our existing assets is our, uh, tech, is our trademark called Circulene, which is where we take these renewable type feedstocks and we put them through existing assets to produce circular-based products. So we're not having to re-invest uh, in polymerization reactors or crackers but using our existing crackers to take in uh, uh, renewable and circular feeds. So they're the things that I want to talk about uh, together and how does that all look together as a total picture. Uh, we, produce, we, we, we have consumption, um, waste management. Uh, we, we bring, we're, we, this is our pilot plant already now constructed in, in, in Italy. Uh, you can see the vehicle there. This is a pilot plant, but you can see it's uh, no small scale and we mean business. Uh, this we want to scale up to 200,000 tonne per annum uh, production of uh, plastic feedstocks for crackers. That then goes into our existing factories uh, to produce uh, circulene products, which go back to the consumer. Circulene being through an existing factory produces these types of products. Those of you not in the plastics industry will be aware that for mechanical recycling, food contact is a big issue. Uh, with this type of technology, uh, we can get into these very uh, food contact applications more, more easily. Uh, and then we have our QCP. And here what we're demonstrating is Mechanical recycling doesn't mean downcycle. You can make very high quality products with lifetime warranty, such as these Samsonite suitcases through mechanical recycling. And so this is a, a real example of a QCP out of our factory in Holland, uh, where we're producing products that, and giving a lifetime, and our customers are giving lifetime warranties on those products. So there's no reason you can't achieve very high quality uh, products out of mechanical recycling. So that's a quick picture of the global uh, picture. What uh, about in Australia? As I said, globally uh, in mechanical recycling, we're working with Suez. What does Suez uh, contribute to this partnership? One of the challenges with mechanical recycling or indeed any recycling is access to feedstocks. And, and Peter talked about access to markets, and that is the most critical uh, point. And, and I can't uh, overstate that point in terms of government procurement and access to markets. But the other point is access to feedstocks. Out these, we're talking scale. We're a major global petrochemical company. We think big. This, our factory in, in, in Netherlands, our, our, our initial factory, we now have a new factory in, in Belgium. 35,000 tonnes production, just being de-bottlenecked to 50,000 tonnes of polypropylene, polyethylene. So this is big scale. To get enough feedstock in the front end of that plant to make it really viable is a challenge itself. And that's where Suez come in. They deliver high quality uh, feedstock into those plants in Belgium and Netherlands. Um, and so you can look at this uh, route two ways. You can either uh, look at the QCP model where you have a bale of post-consumer waste, which uh, Suez deliver at greater than 95% purity, for example, HDPE, and then uh, QCP shred it, they flotation sort it, they hot wash it, they colour sort it, 
and then they compound it using our compounding know-how, upgrade it for that sort of application, uh, such as Samsonite suitcase I showed you. There's another way you can do it. You can uh, have a company that uh, brings the, the, the bale, shreds it, flotation sorts it, hoss watts it, and send, sells it to a company like us who then mix and compound and, and market it to our customers because we've obviously got a good customer uh, access. So they're the two models. Which one of these models is right may depend a little bit on the country or the environment you're in. And in Australia, uh, we are working actively uh, uh, looking at the feasibility uh, of these types of uh, 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 and how we're going to get engaged in investing in this type of uh, uh, from shredding through to the end of this uh, um, uh, value chain. So that's on the curbside area. So that's say bringing high vo volumes of curbside post consumer waste to market. Um, we're also looking at other smaller closed loop projects in Australia and, and we make the polypropylene that goes into takeaway food containers. We're working with our customers on how do we make reusable infrastructure produce these containers. But also importantly, we're looking at a, uh, a closed loop with Waverley Council to bring these containers into a second life manufactured good such as water management. That's not our own game though, that's important in the short term. What we're going to do is siphon off these clean streams and we're going to look at whether we can get them back to food contact through mechanical recycling and then feed them back into our polypropylene plant at Geelong and then ultimately get them back into those containers. And so that's, uh, uh, so whilst this is important to demonstrate that recyclable into second life, what we ultimately want to do is close the loop. And what this does is it gives us a stream of uh, product that we can try and close the loop with. Um, that's mechanical recycling and mechanical recycling is purposely higher on the hierarchy uh, than advanced recycling or chemical recycling. It's lower carbon footprint and always should be our go-to. Only when we can't recycle mechanically should we be thinking about advanced recycling technologies. And I just want to introduce the Circulene uh, product here and what we're doing in Australia to look at the viability of, of, of this type of weight, uh, advanced recycling. What, what you use advanced recycling for is very dirty products or products that simply can't be uh, economically, mechanically recycled. Um, and so um, <clears throat> Circulene is, our, is, is based on a mass balance chain of custody feed. So we feed in circular or renewable feed at the front of, our, of, our, of what we call a cracker which is what we make the monomer that produces polymers from. And we have a mass balance and a chain of custody. I was interested to hear Peter talk about trace and I wonder if it's a similar concept, Peter. But basically this is a concept that we need to start talking about in Australia if we're gonna be successful. And so I did wanna just introduce the concept briefly here. Um, this is the example. We have uh, an existing cracker. These are million ton machines. So, you know, if you want to rebuild a million tonne machine, it'll cost you around uh, two and a half billion dollars. You're not going to rebuild those machines. Uh, what you're going to have to do is work out how you blend fossil feedstock with renewable and circular feedstock in the same reactor. And then you need a chain of custody to make sure that at the other end of that reactor, you end up taking out what's really truly renewable feed. I think of it a bit like green electricity. We haven't gone and built a whole new network of poles and wires in Australia, but what we do is we pay a premium for green electricity and we know we're getting predominantly coal electrons, but what we're doing is we're using the existing infrastructure to deliver them to our homes and, and businesses. And what we're doing then is we're dragging through investment upstream of those poles and wires into renewable electricity. And that's the way I think we have to think about uh, uh, getting renewable and circular feeds into uh, the plastics industry. So we're very focused on how do we get these feeds and over time increase the amount of feed that we put in the front end and we've got to incentivize investments upside of our cracker to produce these things. And so I think of it very much about the green electricity where now green electricity starts to get cheaper than coal-based electricity because we've invested and we've built the scale 
over time. So there's two companies in Europe. Uh, we've already got uh, four plants already certified in Europe, um, but we're certifying these plants on the basis of where that feedstock is. There's no point certifying a plant if you haven't got the feedstock invested in the front end of those plants to be able to feed into the plant. So <clears throat> we're trying to look at how we can encourage that in Australia, but I'd wanted to give you an example of where we are at in Europe. In Europe, this is becoming quite mature. Uh, many of you may have heard of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They're very heavily promoting that we need to get our mind around this uh, chain of custody mass balance approach if we're going to be able to move uh, economically forward uh, on, on, on recycling of uh, feedstock back into uh, uh, plastics and chemicals. So what are we doing in Australia? We're putting together a, uh, two things. One, a, 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 a feasibility review. Uh, so far, uh, Coles have just come into this picture, but I haven't put them on. But uh, Nestle, ourselves, and Lysella, which is a technology uh, company that uh, hydrolyzes uh, waste plastics back into liquid feeds in, in uh, north of Sydney in Newcastle, based on uh, homegrown technology. Um, and we're having a look at what, what, what would that look like to feed Lysella feedstock into the refinery cracker, deliver polypropylene to lined to cell, uh, uh, propylene feedstock to, uh, under this certification scheme. Uh, our customer in Albury called Tagleaf would then produce the film, uh, BOPP film, go to Amcor, for example, to print and, and laminate, and then Nestle to make a Kit Kat, uh, and then Coles to sell it, and so on. And uh, that is a, a demonstration we're also looking to put together uh, in parallel to creating the, uh, the, the, the feasibility study. I think feasibility studies are all very well, but you've got to get people's imagination around these things as well. And so what we want to do is capture people's imagination by actually making Kit Kats uh, out of the pilot material. Uh, going forward. So that's really it. That's all I wanted to present. I hope it gives you some food for thought. Uh, um, and the main message I, wanna, I wanted to give you a bit of sort of uh, on the ground act, uh, view of what we're doing and how we're thinking about this both globally and how we're trying to drive that in Australia. I also wanted to let you know that I think that the, the, the recent changes in, in, in legislation and regulation in, in Australia uh, and, and basically consumer uh, want, it makes Australia quite a fertile ground and I'm excited and I'm very keen that uh, we contribute to Lion Delver Cells 2 million tonnes global target by 2030. And I also want to stress that I think any discussion around, uh, um, around this issue need, should be anchored around the, the waste hierarchy uh, and we should continue to talk about the waste hierarchy because that's what's going to drive. That's what drives the right outcomes and right priorities in terms of how we manage our waste. So that's all um, from my side. I hope that was useful and happy to take questions and participate in the um, uh, sir, uh, workshop. Thank you, Mitchell, and a round of virtual applause as well. Um, yeah, look, I I, I like the. Um, the perspective that you bring that a lot of these actions are local, but it's got to fit in with the global economy. And I think a company that is your size is uniquely able to give us that global view of these sorts of things. Um, but you also made the point that it's important to have access to markets and feedstocks. And they're exactly the two breakout discussions that, that we're going to have uh, in the next bit. Um, we probably have time just for one or two quick questions. Does anybody want to put a question to uh, Mitchell before our breakouts? Uh, yes, sorry, uh, Helen. Hello, thank you so much. Um, Mitchell, that was uh, excellent and thank you. I missed your presentation at the SPE conference, so I feel um, blessed to hear it today. Um, I'm thrilled to hear of some of the initiatives that you have underway here in Australia uh, to have LBA, Quinos and other companies collaborating together um, to help close the loop is great. I think you touched on some really important points, which is feedstock. Access to feedstock is absolutely critical. Um, however, um, getting material through the supply chain is really hard. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're trying to do at um, 
uh, APCO is to run a pledge program somewhat similar to the pledge program that's been run in the EU with great success. Um, and so it'd be wonderful if you could perhaps talk a little bit about the importance of something like that to provide market certainty, remove um, um, uh, uncertainty and reduce risk um, that might play in establishing and making real the sorts of initiatives you're talking about. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, and and I, did, I didn't mention that, I mean, you know, at that hierarchy point, I speaking of APCO, uh, I'm pretty proud that Lion Delver Cell Australia have won our industry category for three years in a row. And last year we won the, the headline category. Um, and that's about our um, use of reusable packaging for our own products, right? So we, you know, we're now 70% of our deliveries are through reusable packaging. Uh, the rest of it is through our own products, polyethylene and polypropylene packaging. But, you know, we're driven to uh, 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 move towards reusable packaging. So, so we're certainly driving those sort of initiatives ourselves. In terms of those pledges, I think what you see, I mentioned Nestle is one of the companies we're, we're working with. A lot of these dri uh, drives are coming from, indeed, those companies who've taken pledges in Europe. So, you know, Nestle has taken those pledges uh, of, of million. I can't remember they've pledged to spend what is it one point something billion francs in, in uh, uh, renewable uh, procurement they've pledged i can't remember the percentage of uh, re recyclable reusable packaging but what you're seeing is companies like nestle because of those commitments they're taking overseas are pressuring their company their their, their subsidiaries in australia to also contribute and get on with them i mentioned our own pledge of two million tons uh, you know, I, I see Australia and my business in Australia getting more on the strategic map of our global company because they do see that Australia has something to offer. So I think, um, you know, more local companies, maybe Helen, that can help, but we're already seeing the impact of those pledges in Europe, uh, in Australia through global companies. Um, you know, Tag Leaf was another one I just mentioned, you know, a UAE company, but uh, the largest BOPP producer in Europe. Uh, similarly driving uh, um, their, their subsidiaries around the world to contribute towards those pledges. Now, you know, much of those deliveries, you see our 15% carbon emission reduction plan. I mean, that's predominantly going to be driven in Europe because the infrastructure is there. Um, I think it can be a bigger number if we see other countries starting to put similar incentives and drivers in place for carbon emission reduction. Um, but, you know, it'd be much nicer to have a 30% target. But, of course, you know, when you have to do all of that heavy lifting in one part of the world, that's a problem as well. But that's, I mean, it's a bit separate to, to plastics, but it, but it is a challenge. And you've got to remember, for us to do these sort of investments, we're talking a five to ten year uh, uh, investment cycle. This is huge in, in, in investment. Um, and so the engineering takes time, the investment takes time. So we do need some of those certainties to be able to make those investments, Helen. And some of those pledges are useful to do that. And that means creating, and that's all about creating demand, Helen. So companies saying, yep, we're going to buy this stuff if you make it. I think then the feedstock will look after itself, to be honest. Uh, you know, we've already got the, the export ban in place. So uh, that's already a great start. And, and uh, we've now got, you know, nationally uh, aligned landfill levies, that's another great start. All those things will help us build, uh, find the feedstock. We've got to keep the refineries as well, though. If we, and that's a risk, frankly, at the moment. Uh, we, we don't know how that's going to look until the middle of this year. If we lose the refineries, you know, I can't imagine you're going to see, you know, companies like Plastics Energy and others investing in, in renewable feedstock in Australia. Uh, it, it'll go offshore into crackers. Uh, that's That'll be what will happen. And there's no way we'll ever invest in new crackers in Australia. We simply don't have the scale. Well, thank you for that sobering thought, Mitchell. Um, look, it, it is time to move on to our um, breakout discussions. Um, you've all previously let Susie know, Susie Jamal, who's uh, sitting there behind the scenes driving this meeting. Um, is about to kick us all into separate breakout rooms. 
Um, it'll happen fairly automatically, but you'll get a little box on your screen which says that you're being moved into a breakout room and you'll have to click to confirm that, that you'll move into those. Um, what we're looking to do, as I said, is to have a conversation which will be structured um, around uh, what we could practically do as uh, kickoff projects um, to address some of the topics that we've been talking about. If you have a problem in moving to the breakout room, Susie is there. You can um, chat to her in the chat function. Um, Sammy is also here. She'll be moving into one of the breakout rooms, but um, there's a bunch of us that will look out to make sure this is smooth. I think, guys, we will give ourselves um, pretty close to the hour because this is an important part of the discussion. So we'll come back again at about five past, and that'll be the time where we find out what the other breakout discussion has been saying and uh, summarize some outcomes and potential actions. So thanks for getting this started, and uh, we'll move now into the next session, the, the breakouts. Right, well, welcome everyone back to the, um, the main session. And um, uh, I was uh, involved in a great conversation. I think um, we were only just getting warmed up. So I guess that's typical of these things. Um, Simon, you were uh, leading our group. Um, would you like to give a bit of a summary of the conversation and maybe some of the outcomes or the points uh, for the broader group? Thanks, thanks Errol. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Simon Pavan. I'm, I'm a professor of marketing at RMIT and I'm someone who works in, strate in strategic sort of brand management. Um, so yeah, I was moderating this, moderating this session with Errol and we, we started off, um, and just, just to take a step back, we're looking at um, what the marketplace will look like that allows a um, circular economy product to be successful and what are the issues around that. We started off by um, asking Katie McMahon from uh, Hobson's Bay um, City Council about some of the initiatives they're, they're, they're undertaking and, um, and what challenges are emerging. And they, she talked about the four bin program they've got where they're actually trying to really separate waste um, to aid in recycling. Um, and one of the issues around that is was contamination because of lack of buy-in around, uh, around you know, how that waste is separated in particular. We have with things like the compost versus the uh, glass and plastics and so forth. And um, small sort of um, sort of action there, we could look at, at, at bringing someone in to help and or advise on a communication strategy around that, whether it's just education or whether it's actually um, an exchange of value through some sort of um, marketing communication to to um, incentivize the public to actually be to be more diligent around that, or to educate them more about um, how their their um, their behaviour is going to improve the um, uh, the environment. Indeed, uh, we're also looking at in terms of that how the glass and, and plastics can be used down the line and where the value really lies. And uh, so another action there be around examining value in the supply chain and. Um, how do you incentivize that? Um, and actually, what data will you need to actually show where the value lies in this? And that will actually then f actually feed into that previous action item around communicating to the public and also to um, small businesses um, in the council footprint. So a couple of nice little projects there. Uh, then we started to get a, a little more uh, a big picture. Um, and, uh, and we had um, Leanne Kemp sort of speak to us a little bit about um, how do we bring this all together? How do we how do we actually um, build a body of knowledge um, around sort of policy development and stimulation of demand for the circular economy, and, and who owns this space? And uh, so, in terms of that, we we began discussing uh, things like um, the collation of case studies um, and and the 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 data that then that feeds into those case studies. Who's responsible for that data? How can we generate good data um, to inform our communication to give us some leverage? Um, where does the material come from, for example, um, in terms of educating consumers and industry groups um, and, uh, and other data we may need um, to lobby and just to get people interested, interested in understanding the circular economy. So the action, the action there is sort of RIT has a, has a consumer, uh, has a, um, a circular economy hub. Uh, there was mention perhaps that ATSI could get involved in this as well, but really the group that sits here now um, uh, we can expand and look to develop a community of practice. We have people from around the nation today 
and um, and it would be um, very useful to sort of seek further meetings and, and, and involve big business and other organizations, more small business and entrepreneurs um, into this community of practice um, and thus generate more case studies. Um, then we looked at sort of challenges around uh, mapping of, of waste to value and land. Uh, told us a story about Dell parts being used in jewelry, how that's a non-competitive scenario that Dell were interested in and think they'd be interested in small businesses, but, but when that gets extrapolated into multiple small businesses, it becomes valuable. Um, and the project around mapping waste to value and placing value on waste. That's possibly some sort of um, a collaborative sort of grant uh, approach and that, that would be the action perhaps um, could be looked at and pursued down the line, but certainly some seed projects or some small projects to actually inform that would be really useful as well. Um, and then we close with, um, we were just starting to talk about this challenge around what is the driving force of, of the circular economy. I think that's a, a project in itself, which, uh, which needs further discussion and really does incentivize us meeting again to talk, talk further. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And uh, very well led as well. Um, Ian, would you like to give us uh, an update on what your group's discussion was? Uh, you're on mute still. There you go. We could have obviously spent a lot of uh, a lot more time than we had on this topic, and we had a really great discussion, a lot of contribution from uh, all the, all the people in the group. Um, just touching on some of the more general things, um, we talked about some of the challenges that we face in with the polypropylene case. It's getting to food contact status uh, for recycled material, which has been more easily achieved with some other polymers. We talked about the problem of having colored uh, polymers, particularly black polymers, and the, the problem that creates uh, when you're sorting them. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about the role of government in all of this um, and how difficult it is uh, to deal with local councils. You've got lots of these councils, they're not particularly uh, necessarily technically savvy and uh, they don't really know what best practice is in terms of, of recycling and sorting and the like. And uh, it's a real challenge to try and talk to, to the councils and uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, also, the industry can potentially make life easier for councils by simplifying products, maybe removing some additives which might add to the aesthetics of a product but cause problems in recycling. And, and really come out with simpler designs for our products, more standard ways of producing a given product so that it's more intrinsically more recyclable, uh, more easy to identify and, and to remove from the stream. Um, we did hear from, from CSIRO who brought, put on the table the whole question of carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide has many dimensions. How do we cost carbon dioxide when we look at the life cycle of these products and how do we factor in all these other costs like carbon dioxide, environmental costs and other costs so we have a real basis for comparing recycle back to virgin. Um, it seems that we need, we need uh, an independent group uh, to really look at some of these issues that, uh, that industry competitors find very hard to deal with. And so a role was identified for an organisation like CSIRO that could look at some of these big questions and provide guidance to the industry sector as a whole on what best practice should look like and maybe what standard should be uh, adopted or perhaps universities looking at best practice for life cycle analysis and related things like that where, where we can have a better measurement of, of the real cost of recycle versus virgin materials. Um, there was, um, there was, there were further sort of closing comments. Um, Mitchell did mention that his company is, he, he reinforced that his company is spending a lot on, on this area in general. And presumably there's an opportunity for Australian researchers with the right project to help support his company. Uh, and so I guess that's an opportunity with multinational companies in particular, the research, research, research community to deal with the multinational company and tap into some of their big programs and where they've got unique skills that can add some real value. I thought that was a really interesting 
uh, sideline. So Mitchell thought that we needed better trust and data uh, around around LCA and um, and a good advice to local councils. Um, so um, there was a whole issue of CO2, which we talked about. Um, the thought was that the packaging industries got off to a really good start in terms of recycling and pledging and recycling guidelines. Um, but once again, you know, what, what are the real costs involved and uh, what about the, the litter issues? Um, and I think, I think a lot of it rests on government to really show leadership here and, and help the industry uh, move towards standards and, and, and really act more cohesively. Um, some of the other people in the group didn't get a chance to add some comments to, to what was included in the summary. So I'll open it up to members of the group who, uh, who would like to, to add some additional points that they think were important that I haven't covered. Yeah, thanks, Ian, and that'd be great. So it is um, open to anybody to amplify or add. Yeah, Mitchell. Oh, I just wanted to clarify a comment that uh, Ian made about the ability for companies like mine to spend R&D dollars in Australia. I have this discussion with the COVID Commission and various other government people. The challenge we have in Australia is that companies like mine who do allocate a couple of hundred to you know, a quarter of a billion in, in R&D spend a year, we will spend it where we can invest. And the problem is if you don't have an industry, uh, this is a bit separate topic, but if you don't have a real drive and an industry strategy in the country where people can see a future for investment in Australia, in the country, you're much less likely to attract those R&D dollars uh, into this country. So, I, I, and that's an important uh, clarification, Ian. Yes. And that's why I mentioned, you know, if we lose the refineries, we lose all these companies in Australia, then we've got no hope. And it's already difficult enough, um, you know, when we're not growing and not investing to attract uh, those research dollars into Australia. I, you know, you mentioned I was in Dubai for seven years running, I was a managing director. Uh, we were spending $35 million a year in Saudi Arabia on R&D. Um, why were we doing that? Is because that's where we had investments of assets going in. And, mm. uh, and that's where we'll continue to invest. So I just want to make that clarification. I think it's not 100% relevant, but it's really important that we all understand that in organisations like yours, that to attract that, uh, that global company R&D dollars, um, you know, that, that we also need to be growing our manufacturing base in Australia and see an opportunity to invest in Australia. I think ATSI would be delighted to see that happen. I think uh, that's that's really what ATSI is all about. Yeah. And I think that's part of the argument you've got to continue to make with government. If you don't have an industry policy, you won't attract investment and we won't get those R&D dollars. I'll go to other countries. Hmm. The other thing I might add to that, um, Mitchell, is that there is no such thing as a silver bullet in this space. And I, I um, had brought to my attention a, a report that was put out by the Pew Charitable Trusts last year around um, looking at the various kind of levers that we've got and the sorts of impacts that they might have on reducing particularly um, plastics entering the environment and the impact that that's having on the marine environment in particular. And it looks at a, a lot of different levers that we're talking about here that are being spoken about broadly across the world. And the fact that they, they need to be um, employed in concert because not one of them in particular is gonna fix the problem. It's gotta be a whole range of solutions that need to be considered and addressed. I guess one of the um, interesting things to that that I saw in our conversation is that yes, we need global action and national action, but you can make a difference at council level. And I found that quite encouraging. Um, I guess one of the thoughts that was in our group was how do we make sure that there are broad understanding of the various case studies which are going around and how do we learn from each other effectively. There are some platforms which are around to share case studies, um, but generating those case studies also seems to me like a valuable activity that particularly when we're trying to build the, um, um, the public view of the importance of this area. 
Anybody else have any other thoughts or comments? Uh, yeah, I do. Thanks, um, uh, Errol. Uh, one of my comments is the um, we seem somehow to think that having targets is a is a bad thing. I'd really like to put on the table that uh, targets are a magnificent thing. They're used extensively in business. Uh, they're part of KPIs. They're part of performance assessments. So too, they are really powerful in industry associations and in industry groups, uh, and likewise in governments at all levels. Uh, and um, you know, a target is something just in the same way we have for OHS and level of injuries on sites and those sorts of things. There's nothing like having, like we have now in Australia, the recycled content targets for packaging. If we had targets for circularity, for um, durability of plastic products, for um, levels of investment, for um, number of people employed, or a range, I'm just pulling some things out of the air like that. And if that was something that was established by ATSI, by uh, Chemistry Australia, by any organisation, every organisation has it within their powers to establish those sorts of um, targets for them to be endorsed by their organisation. Local councils, um, I think uh, uh, was pointed out, have established targets for carbon reduction emissions. There's no reason again why, you know, every organisation, and I put, you know, the challenge to ATSI, I put the challenge to Chemistry Australia, um, APCO has set targets for recycled content for recovery rates for plastics. Um, so the same can be done in other areas. So I really advocate for that to be a driver of change. And if that can be done in the plastics industry to support the growth of the industry, the health and the resilience of the industry, then that would be a magnificent thing. Brilliant. Thanks, Helen. Um, Any other I, I like to uh, emphasize on the um, the power of collaboration uh, to move towards a circular economy. So I guess a lot of the things that we talked about, um, uh, challenges with recycling and getting markets enabled. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a need for, for example, recyclers to talk with the designers of products. Um, there's a need for um, uh, industry associations, uh, industries to talk with universities to tell them uh, what are the skills that they need developed of undergraduates, what are the um, um, uh, for example, research that needs to be done on a priority basis. So um, uh, it, it's, uh, I mean, the change and the transformation that we can make, we can, um, we can sort of uh, drive um, through collaborating uh, with different types of groups um, with an objective, with a purpose is, uh, is, is, is quite strong. Um, so um, I, I guess, uh, I mean, adding on to what you said about case studies as well, building up an evidence base where those collaborations actually create good success stories, sharing and encouraging to continue to do that and getting them accessible for a, a variety of stakeholders is, is going to be very useful. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's my son, Otherwise, four year old. Future for people like him. Uh, yeah. yep. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Errol. And it was mentioned, I'm just trying to remember who mentioned it, but a, a role for ATSI may, may well be is so there's the case studies, but there's also a need for a new, new, you know, terminology, metrics, value, you know, how we measure these things. And that might be, you know, as, as, a, uh, an, as an association, that independence that you bring to the table, that might be a role for you because there's a whole lot of work to be done there. And it's, and it's about looking at, you know, how do we measure this? How do we measure outcomes? What are the, what are the, you know, it's triple bottom line, it's social, it's financial and it's environmental. And it brings in a lot of diverse players to start building up that body of knowledge about, about the metrics and, and the measurement and the definitions. And you know, what does that definition mean in this, in this domain of expertise? And you know, there's a whole dictionary to be written there on a new economy. Um, and that might be something that 
it's, it's not a small project, but it's something that will bring, you know, require a lot of collaboration to develop. Just a thought. Yeah, I, th I think you're right there, Peter. It struck me that some of the fundamental issues which people have talked about are excellent research topics. Um, one of the phrases which was used in our group was um, mapping this waste to value stream. Um, there'll be many maps and they'll be different depending on what section, but in fact, building the, uh, the techniques to do that and the discipline to do that, um, I think is really important as an underpinning bit because on top of that sits the data. And when we, when we spoke um, about the data, who should collect it, who gains value from it? I think one of the points which was made again in our group was that it's that entrepreneurism is likely to come from relatively small innovators um, more quickly than from large organizations that perhaps have more inertia. So perhaps there's an opportunity is to see if we can stimulate or encourage some of the entrepreneurial activities building on the data which has to underpin some of the things that we've talked about. Look, just in, in closing, um, this was, as I said, meant uh, by the Academy to get a conversation going, uh, both within the Academy and without. Um, we have several fellows on this call. I think pretty well all of us are in the Industry and Innovation Forum. Uh, Dimity chairs that, and um, we've been listening carefully to, to the thoughts and ideas here. So we, within ATSI, will certainly have a way of um, taking on board some of these things and discussing them further. But I'd also encourage you, even if you're not in ATSI, to keep the communication going with others. Um, there was a general email that Susie sent out to invite everybody to this discussion. Through that email, you will have everybody else's email address. If you can't find it or need to find a different way to connect, um, please don't hesitate to get back in touch with either Susie or myself um, and uh, we'll help uh, facilitate the linkages if uh, you can't find those email addresses. But as I say, what I really encourage you to think about what else you'd like to do to follow on with this conversation. Um, and you don't need ATSI to be there, um, but we'd be delighted to hear what comes out if you do pursue the discussion. Um, Dimity, you're, you're there. Would you like to uh, finish off with any closing comments uh, from Thank the you, Errol. perspective? Thank you very much. Um, my overarching um, feeling that I've had from listening, and I'm a newcomer to the circular economy, I've just been listening and learning, and I've learned so much in one session. Um, I, I do believe that, as I've said in the chat side, there's a really big role for ATSI in advising the, Queen, the uh, federal government, but also in um, taking on some sort of a coordination role. There's so many different projects that are coming that you read about in the newspapers, in the press, and, uh, and so many mentioned here. I think that um, this organisation is particularly suited to that role, or at least to advising on that role. Well, great, thanks. I see some nods on the head, so we will certainly carry on carrying the torch. Look, behind uh, the scenes to make this all work, there have been some terrific support from the ATSI office. And I do want to give a shout out to Susie Jamil, who's in there. So there she is. She can see her face. She's not just an email address. And also Sammy Hook, who's um, the ATSI policy person. Um, thank you guys very much for helping get this done. Um, I am slightly amazed the technology worked pretty seamlessly from my perspective. So maybe only one or two minor glitches, but congratulations to everyone for working your Zoom so well. Um, and uh, as I say, please carry on the conversation. Uh, thank you very much also to our keynotes, Peter and Mitchell. Um, having your kickoffs being so grounded in practicality, I think is a really important part of our conversation too. So. Thank you all for your contributions.
um, I've enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I think we've got a lot of work to do as well. So with that, I'll sign off and thank you all. See you okay, then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.